Welcome to the next instalment of the Parent Guide to Education podcast. Today we're joined by Tom Cleary, who is here to talk to us about how parents can help their introverted child. Hi, Tom. So we're talking today how parents can help their introverted child. Now, I know we're going to have a lot of questions for you as the parents of an introvert, but why why is this such an important topic for you? What kind of brought you to this? Hi, both. Nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me uh, on here, first of all. Um, it's a topic which, as somebody who scores around 94% on introversion and whose background is about well-being, mental health, personal development, and an ex-teacher, that combination leads me towards actually quite a big passion for things like this. And I wish I'd known more when I was younger there as well. Excellent. So, I mean, let's start with the basics. You just talked about you know, scoring on the, the introversion scale. How do you, what are the clear signs that you've got an introvert and how, how does that tend to manifest? And how do you assess yourself? Where is this oh, scale? Yeah. <laughs> Lots of great questions there. Um, there are so many misconceptions and misunderstandings about introversion. And a lot of people think introversion is shyness, for example, that somebody who's very quiet and who can't talk in a social setting is therefore an introvert, which is not the case. There are often overlaps between the two of them. There are debates still on the exact definition of introversion. If you Google it, you will get shy and quiet, which really irritates me and a lot of other people I work with in psychology. Um, but introversion is normally described as where we get our social energy from. So if somebody um, who may well enjoy being with other people, but needs to have some recharge time away from that by themselves at the point, normally described as an introvert. There's also things about how we process uh, dopamine, how we respond to different situations, how we um, get our energy from different places and different stimuli as well. So as far as knowing you have an introvert, it's normally somebody who is a little bit quieter, more reflective. Um, there are often overlaps with shyness, and perhaps they might be a bit more reticent to form relationships, but it might also be they take longer to warm up and might prefer to have fewer close connections than they do to have a large group of friends as well. Well, that, that probably answers my next question then, because I'm pretty sure by your definition, I am officially an introvert, which I kind of always thought I was personally. But I also quite enjoy stuff like oh, I like performing on the stage. I, I run a choir and I think I put on a, a persona when I am being choir director where I'm quite kind of bubbly and outgoing. But it's the the interpersonal stuff that when you sit and chat with a group of people, I find that quite tiring. That that kind of sucks my energy away rather than giving me energy. And so. Um, so, yes, I think I'm, I'm seeing a lot of where she gets it from now. Yeah. Can I add something which goes back to um, Paul's point too about, I, I think that very often um, human beings, we like to put ourselves into boxes. We like neat little labels. So I'm over here, you're over here. And I find that a lot with introversion and extroversion. It's like, I'm an introvert, I sit here. I'm an extrovert, I like this. But they are on a scale. And so I mentioned earlier 94% for me. There are various, and I do call them clumsy ways of measuring it because they, you know, doing, you know, 50 questions online is never going to give you an accurate view of who you are as a unique, complex individual. But when you're doing loads of them and you always score in that high percentage, you've got a pretty good idea that that's where you're going to be sitting. But you can have people who um, are ambiverts, they sit in the middle of those two and they're happy to kind of flex either way. And you can have people who don't look like an introvert in the way that we have as our stereotype. Um, when you see me delivering well-being training sessions, I'm quite bouncy, I'm quite outgoing. I was nicknamed Tigger. We're going to give my PGCE training. And people will say, but you're clearly very extroverted. Like, no, I'm not. Ask me to go for lunch after my training session. I will find any reason possible to go and sit by myself outside. Um, so that spectrum makes a difference too. Yeah. Um, yes. And as it, so Paul is pointing at me, for those of you that are listening on the podcast rather than watching, because... It, yeah, absolutely. And and our daughter's the same. She, uh, We went out to catch up with some old friends yesterday and they said, you know, did, did your daughter not want to not want to stop by? I said, no, she's 
she's had a lot of peopling this week and she's peopled out. She just needs some time to be on her own and recharge. Mm. And I think that's that's probably the key with her is knowing for us, you know, she's had enough now. She just needs a bit of of chill out time. We when we're in a big big social situation or you know, if we have a big family gathering. I'll try and make sure that she's got the opportunity to escape if she needs to, because I know it gets a bit bit much. But she's also happy to be the centre of attention and look after 40,000 children. And Well, but more with the small children, because I think she, like me, which may be an introvert thing, it may be an ADHD thing, I don't know, but we're, we're quite good with small children. We like small children. They're easy. They're obvious. They don't, they don't worry about, are you making the right amount of eye contact? You're not making enough eye contact. Did you interrupt me 47 times? Because we we do that automatically and we have to concentrate on that stuff when we're talking with adults, which adds to the the tiring kind of aspect of, of social interaction. Yeah. Can I just ask about dopamine? Um, it's mm. something that keeps coming up in my life at the moment a lot. <laughs> um, what's the, is there a link? What is the link between dopamine in a teenage brain and the potential to be an introvert? There are arguments about how it works and whether it's to do with the saturation point that we reach. So whether we process um, it more slowly and therefore an extrovert will need to have more exposure to things which create dopamine in order to have that level of same simulation that somebody who's introvert has had from that one small exposure, it's still there in the brain. So it can be to do with speed. There's also um, some research that looks at how sensitive we are to it as well so perhaps a smaller amount leads us to feel more um we tend to have levels for each of us that we want to, to work at we want to feel a certain level of stimulation and for introverts in theory smaller amounts of, of excitement of any any kind can lead to yep yeah, that's me done now i'm very happy with that amount whereas an extrovert could be yep yeah, that was great but but what's next i feel like i need a little bit more of that to, to come through but with a lot of these, there's conflicting research on the exact ways it's being done. And then if you look into sample sizes and whether or not there's been a diverse range of people. So I'm always hesitant to say it's definitely this or that, which some places will say. It's, I would just say people have an open mind about when you hear definite facts about things like that. Hmm. So I was just gonna, it's a very quick follow up then. So it, with an extrovert, are we saying is it, there are their behaviour is almost determined by the fact they know they need to behave, behave a certain way to get the dopamine hit to feed their you know, the way their brain is wired. Um, it depends what you mean by no, I suppose, because it might be that they don't know consciously that that's what they're doing. But if any of us feel better each time we're in a certain situation, we are more likely to then go back again and again to that situation. So I've got lots of friends who are, they probably score between 80 and high 90s on extroversion. And um, our lives look very different. So you mentioned your daughter's very lucky to have parents who will schedule in, by the way, that non-people time. In my diary, if I've got a big training session, I will schedule in that. I spoke to somebody um, online last week who said if they have a quiet day at work, they schedule in people time. So we tend to do things, even if we don't, we're not aware about why we're doing them, that work for us. Hmm. Yeah, really interesting. It's bizarre, because I do that, but I never really thought about doing that. It's just, it's what I, it's how my week pans out. If I've had a busy week at work, I'm desperate to go out and do stuff on a, on a weekend and, and just get out of the house and see people. But Yes, yeah. whereas I am going, I've had a really, really busy week, I really just want to sit on my own and whatever it is you know watch some tv crochet which is my current obsession whatever it is just some some calm down time i think and and that i think does tie into the fact that because we are both neurodiverse myself and my daughter we get overstimulated quite easily because our filters don't work in the same way like in terms of all of the stuff that comes at you at once your brain ought to filter out the stuff that's not important ours doesn't always so it just sometimes it's a bit much and I want to just have like one thing just the one thing and then I'm good because otherwise I get stressed out it's it's too much for me so yes we're I think we're very opposite almost in that in that you will seek out a bit of additional mm. something and um, so 
what other things can we do then, thinking specifically about parents supporting their children again, in terms of you know so helping your introverted child feel okay and learn how to manage that you know th those feelings that need for a little bit of away time and and so on is it just about helping them build in some non-peopling time or is there other stuff we can do there's so much that we can do and um one of the biggest things i'll start with is trying to challenge the assumption which i still see a lot all over the place that introversion is a negative thing that needs to be fixed um i had someone tell me recently that you can't be successful if you are an introvert tell that to people like bill gates um it's something where um and it comes from many sources one of the biggest measures of personality traits was done where they removed introversion but they just had the extroversion part of it so you either scored really well on that or you scored badly on that and so the wording for those who are more introverted was very negative it was antisocial. it was shy it was unable to can't and that's echoed through into a society where um we do celebrate extroversion whether it's in schools whether it's in personal life it's in the workplace we are measured by how many friends we have, how many likes we have, how many followers we have. And it's something which is, I still see happening um, every day at the moment. So starting off with that introversion is not a bad thing, it's a different thing. Um, also being aware of differences between introversion, shyness, and also things further down the spectrum like social anxiety. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I'll have a parent who will contact me and will say, um, my child is really struggling at school, they are unable to talk in class, they get really nervous, they might be showing signs of physical distress through that. And sometimes you can get an extrovert who actually loves being around people, who has quite a severe form of anxiety where they, they fear being judged by others, and um, they are stopping them from being with other people. So thinking about exploring as parents what these things will mean, um, rather than the assumption of they're quiet, therefore they are this or that. Um, and I'll also throw in one more thing, which is about HSPs, so highly sensitive people as well, where people are very, um, I, I have, I score 85% as an HSP, where uh, loud noises and a lot of simulation will really impact me. Um, so I would say for parents, first of all, get the foundations of what these things are, and how they work and start challenging the negative stereotype but i'm going to stop for a second because i could go on for about the next three hours at <laughs> <of> well <Wales. laughs> yeah i mean i i'd made a note before this to to say because facebook knows me well and it shows me memes that it thinks i will appreciate there's the one about you know why is it that we're always trying to persuade introverts to come out of their shell and to to be more sociable and what have you, when we're not busy telling extroverts to just sit down and be quiet, just for a little bit, just calm down. Because you're right, it's it's the perception, it's the, the labels that we give ourselves. And, and while I know sometimes as an extrovert, you do get told to, that you're a bit much and that you need to calm down and things, I think you get a lot more of that feedback about how you can improve yourself if you're an introvert. And it's always, you know, why don't you just get out and meet some more people? Why don't you take up a new hobby that's more sociable? <laughs> because I don't want to, because <laughs> that will make me miserable. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's all about the, the language that you use, isn't it? And I'd imagine it's particularly difficult if you are, say, two extroverted parents who have an introvert child, because you, you don't get them in the same way. And uh, I think... It, You've kind of got to understand a lot of what they, how they're feeling in order to deal with what they're feeling appropriately and, and support them the best. I know Paul struggles with some of the, the more ADHD things that the pair of us do, whereas I totally get why she does them. Things like being unable to keep her bedroom tidy. Oh, no, I, I do struggle with that. I was sitting there thinking, like, can't... what are you talking about? I'm totally understanding yeah. of everything. Tidying the bedroom, I don't get it at all. But... That's because that's how my brain works and not how his brain works. And I think we get a similar thing sometimes, don't we, with, with introversion. So I've got a thing down here. Nature, nurture. Is there, is there a mm -hmm. link? 
Yes. Um, again, one of those things where there's arguments going on about this, even as we speak. So there's quite a lot of research that people are born with a certain leaning towards being more introverted and more extroverted. They've done research on infants where they've exposed them to um, a lot of simulation through light, noise, etc. And the very young children who react strongly to those things, you would think would be extroverts, normally turn out to be quite introverted because their systems are responding really strongly to what's going on. The babies or young children who are very, very quiet um, are like, no, this is okay, I can, do, I can deal with this. And they will tend to seek more stimulation later. But with the nurture part of it, um, there's a lot of research that the way that our upbringings shape us can take us further down that pathway or they can um, negate some of those sort of innate impacts that are going on. So it is, it is a bit of both um, that's going on normally. Hmm. Interesting. We've got twins and uh, one is an extrovert and one is, I think, pretty introverted and they've had the same influences, the same, pretty much the same everything. And yet they've, and I think as time goes on, they they move further apart in terms of yeah. um, you know, their confidence levels and uh, one being extrovert, one being introvert. So, so yeah, I, so. I wonder, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say these things are never simple, are they? It's never kind of like an obvious you can predict from this one thing, is it? No, I was just wondering, because you said that you've got that combination of two of you, of introvert and extrovert, and whether that's allowed growth in both directions for, for your children. And if you had two introverts or two extroverts, whether that would be a different... I don't know. It's just something which is interesting to explore, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, it does sound like there's a lot of research left to be done. It's There's lots of ideas, mm -hmm. lots of thoughts, um, but... I yeah. think there's still still lots of uh, unanswered questions, I guess. Yes, and one of those, one of the big ones, I think, is probably going to be around the impact of the pandemic, and and how that has impacted children. Because, I mean, going back to nature nurture, a lot of children through their kind of key developmental years, where they would normally be in a really social situation at school and so on, had a year or so with very little. You know, it was at home with the same people all the time doing the same things do you think that's likely to have had a an impact if so you know how much is there anything we can do to mitigate it so many questions <laughs> um go back to paul's first that's okay in terms of yes lots of research to do and lots of questions unanswered i think sometimes that um there's a consensus which is still there about things which do help so I've had some parents come to me who get lost in the, oh my goodness, there's so much that's not quite decided yet and we're not quite sure what, which way to go. And that can cause parents to feel even more out of control and not know what they're doing. And I would say that the, the kind of antidote to that is to just be open-minded that things are developing and evolving all the time, but there has remained a consensus about certain things which help both children and parents, which seems to be relatively stable. So as a kind of um, life raft for children, for parents who might be struggling a little bit, that's hopefully a good thing to, to hear. And then the pandemic, um, yes. So it, and it's been really interesting in general with the pandemic because originally there was lots of um, articles coming out which were saying, oh, introverts have thrived in the pandemic and they really love this and extroverts have really struggled. And then there's another way that came through not that long ago saying, actually, it's not quite that simple. And extroverts did much better in many senses than introverts did because of resilience and well-being and having lots of connections to see them through. So again, it's that kind of murky part. But for a lot of children who were homeschooled and who therefore missed out on um, the ability to socialise in the way that we would always have done so. I've got quite a few who have um, had to kind of relearn how that works and to relearn social social skills. But I've had quite a few who have gone, oh, I never realised how much I loved this way of communicating or having more time to myself or being able to communicate online and have more control over when that when that ended. I think the biggest thing it did was make people of all ages aware of our preferences and what works for us and therefore more able to, depending on how much control they have, address those things a little bit more. So it, it, it's definitely had an impact, good and bad, but I'm hoping in the long run it's actually going to be a positive thing. 
kind of brings me to my next question, which was, um, is we worry as parents about when our children become adults and have to go out in the world and, and cope with things for themselves. And I think when you've got a very introverted child, you you worry perhaps that they won't be able to go out and do the things they need to do because they don't want to talk to people face to face or anything like that. I, I would always rather email uh, than phone call. I hate phone calls with a passion because I can't prepare what I'm going to say in the same way, I think is the best way to explain it. So from my point of view, anything I can do online without talking to a person that is what I will do. Whereas you'll quite happily jump on the phone with someone and discuss, you know, rates of renewal for insurance and what have you. You'll, I would rather yeah, I would, spend hours researching online than have a conversation. When you've got to think of things on the fly, so in terms of selling products, you know, mm -hmm. I, I'd struggle yeah. with that. I'd rather email and I don't like, I don't know if it's confrontation. I, I do slightly struggle with that, but that's but by the by. <laughs> from, a, from the point of view of a, an introverted child, I think there's that internal battle as a parent between I, I want them to just be happy as they are and be able to be themselves, but do I need to help them push themselves out of their comfort zone a little bit to to support them with the things that I know they're going to have to cope with mm. further down the line? And and how how and where do we balance that, I guess, is my question. It's such an important one, and it goes back to something you mentioned earlier where you said that... Um, you know, as introverts, we're often told to be more sociable and open up and extroverts very rarely. I am a firm believer that wherever we sit, we can all do work to develop ourselves. And whether that is somebody who sits at the very high end of extroversion and actually finds it hard to, in situations which would benefit from this, is to think first and then to, to speak. And then for introverts who are very much aiming to think first before I speak, but might be in a situation where they need to do that, we can develop those skills. So I think everybody needs to do that. And I think that once we have that foundation of this isn't a bad thing and it's something which we can all develop, it's thinking about um, helping both children and parents think about what their values are, what they're trying to achieve in life. And if they want to go in that direction, what skills might we need to develop to, to achieve that. I'll give you a, a, an example, which is from, from myself. I have a particularly killer combination of high introversion, an HSP, um, very shy, and at several points, high social anxiety. And I was somebody who physically could not speak to people at all. When I was at university, I um, would go into a lecture and the first thing I would do from a new module is I would turn to the assessment page. If it's a presentation, I walked out the back door of the lecture theatre, never, never passed people, went to the office and said, can I change what module? I couldn't speak. Um, had to do one, at least one that was um, compulsory and I was on you know, medication from doctors to stumble through it. I now will speak to hundreds of strangers every week as part of my, my, my work. And it's because I've learned that in order for me to do what I do and what brings me happiness and meets my values, I've had to develop that but also within my introversion to think about my recharge points afterwards so i think finding out you know what's important to to that person thinking about in order to get there what we're missing and how can we develop those particular skills i like the idea of recharge points i know we've mm. kind of vaguely touched on it earlier but that to make it so clear that that's what you're doing having done something that's out of your comfort zone i need a recharge i need quiet time whatever <coughs> Yeah, because sometimes just a way to explain that you need some alone time, some quiet time, that is just as difficult sometimes is, is explaining, no, do you know what, I just, I just need a bit of me time. A recharge is, is a good way to explain it. I um, uh, made a couple of notes of things I want to follow up on, but the first being um, the changes to personal statements. So Paul does a lot of work with Year 12 students helping them prepare personal statements to apply for university. But that's all changing. So as we record this current year 11s, we'll have to do the new system. With the idea being it's more, you know, they'll, they'll give you perhaps five questions and you have to record your answer, but it's going to be a presentation style thing. And my first thought on hearing it was, well, that's going to kill my child. She's going to hate that passionately. 
because she is very much an introvert. So is that some, is that one of those things where it's just helping her step out of her comfort zone a little bit more in the run up to it, just to, to support her with that? Yeah. Um, I'll flip back to reach for a second if that's okay, because I think that's a really important part. So we had a conversation in my introvert community about two weeks ago about what our recharge sort of points or stations are. And just sharing those normalized it for some people's partners and went, oh, that's why you pop into a bookshop in the middle of London, because it's a quiet, safe space for you to recharge and then come back out. So normalizing those conversations is really valuable. Coming back to the personal statement. Um, yes, I think if so many systems that we have, whether it is in education, whether it is in general life or whether it's in work later on, um, they will be ones that don't necessarily match with our personal styles. And if you can see behind me, there's a little picture of a hot air balloon that was um, bought for me by my, one of my best friends, oh goodness knows, decades ago now, which says life begins at the end of your comfort zone, which prompts me continuously to go, if I'm saying no due to a fear of something, maybe I'm going to say yes. So I'm on the podcast now because of that. My first podcast, middle of last year, someone said to me, can I interview you? I said, no, absolutely not. Couldn't possibly do that. Saw the picture and went, I said no, but actually I probably should do it. So, so yes. And the other part of it is um, I work with so many trainers, facilitators, public speakers who are massive introverts. And very often, if there's the prep time behind it, it's so much easier. So in this case, if there's prep time and it's a subject that you know about, hopefully yourself as well, can make it a lot easier. And then practicing that before it's actually recorded so you feel comfortable in your own skin. And even standing up makes a huge difference too, to confidence. We always tend to sit down when recording things. Standing up makes a massive difference. There are ways that we can push ourselves to do really well. And I, I know so many people who actually always used to hate that sort of thing. Who got, oh, if we're in this kind of context, I quite like this. So I, I'd love to hear later on how that goes for her as well. Yeah, and that's absolutely spot on because uh, you were the same. Uh, as a business, uh, we've got to the point where we now get contacted by various radio stations when they want to talk to someone who's an ex-teacher or an ex-teacher of maths, specifically for me, um, something to do with GCSEs. And that's that's normally me. That's that's my job. I am the speaker. But the other week we had uh, we had the phone call and I had COVID and was coughing and didn't have much of a voice. And so handed it over to Paul. And it was your first time, wasn't it? And you were, I think, relatively terrified. Uh, Just, I, I'm not. I, well, out of your there's an easy zone. out because you tend to do it. So but when you can't breathe mm. or speak, then no, apparently not yeah. that good. And, and so, he uh, was fantastic. And I think now, if you had to do it again, you'd be a lot less apprehensive because it's it's one of those when you've done it once, it's not so scary anymore. And um, and so that comes back to the whole stretching your comfort zone gradually, I guess. So it's... Um, I mean, I, I wish I could stretch my comfort zone more regularly because just in terms of, you know, um, if I do a video for LinkedIn, for example, trying to... Yeah, sell part of the business. Um, you know, I, I shouldn't care what some people think. Sometimes I'll have mates commenting on on what I've done, say you, you look stupid, you, you know, or take the Mickey out of what I've said. Or it's like I shouldn't worry about what they're saying. I should just do it because it's what I need to do for the business to make it grow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I do take kind of I don't know, mm. criticism or Mickey taking whatever it is quite personally. So and you tend to rehearse as well and, and do that prep time that we talked about well, the 46,000 yeah. shoots rather than recording <laughs> rather than just doing it once that mm -hmm. you tend to do and but that's purely because mm -hmm. otherwise if I don't if I don't do stuff like this live if I don't record things and just go right that's it if I have a, a, a safety net I will use it and I'll stumble and go oh I need to start again and I'll end up doing it six or seven times whereas if I if I take away the safety net I know I've got to get it right which adds the pressure, which, to be honest, helps my ADHD brain because deadlines and pressure and emergencies get things functioning a little bit better. But um, but yeah, it's all it's all just stretching your comfort zones, isn't it? Rather than taking a massive leap out leap outside it, it's just like pushing it a little bit further away, I guess. So baby steps. 
Um, we, we had a question from uh, from somebody on our email list about uh, their child who doesn't like to stick their hand up in class. Constant feature of um, parents' evenings, great student, just never asks any questions, doesn't stretch themselves, quite happy to sit there at the back, preferably at the corner, wherever, just to keep out of the limelight. Is there anything, I, you know, we've touched on on ways that potentially they can help, but how do you how do you encourage, when you're not with them, they're in a classroom full of probably extrovert children, how do you encourage them to have more of a voice? It's something which came up a lot when I was teaching and where there are a lot of schools, colleges, universities who are trialing different ways of doing it. I was listening to something uh, last week which talked about even changing the words from being somebody who participates in a classroom, which tends to be talking to the whole class, to how engaged they are in that classroom. With parents I've worked with in the past, I've often said to them, um, have you actually asked your child exactly what the barrier is? We tend to make the assumption they're quiet, they're shy, they don't have the confidence to do that. There could be lots of different reasons why, but the reason would be that starting point behind it. Very often, if it isn't something like social anxiety, which can be a different matter that, that's worth sort of exploring, if it is to do with either shyness or lack of confidence or introversion again each of those has a different response to it if it's introversion is their thinking time allowed in the classroom is the um other teachers aware and hopefully most of them will be teaching is a, a very hard job where you're juggling a million things that you have to be doing mm -hmm. but the awareness of different styles of um responding and thinking is growing the times when i hear this the most is when the the setting is I'm going to pick people at random and expect them to think on the spot. And if it's introversion, maybe speaking to the teacher with the child, if it is to do with that, that issue, about are there ways that we can give some preference to those who need to speak really quickly because that's how they're formulating their thoughts and those who need to just take a moment. And I have some of my um, clients who will have a piece of paper to make notes on to process when they're doing this too in order to speak. The other part of it is, are we creating the psychologically safe classrooms where children have that growth mindset that if they get something wrong, that's okay, rather than I've got it wrong, I'm not going to overthink and focus on this the entire time. And one episode of that can make a difference. So with parents, finding out what's actually going on and then working with um, your child. And if possible, if there's a certain time it's happening with that teacher or those teachers to think about are there ways which benefits everybody you know the parent the child and the teacher um to think about making this a really safe environment to to talk in and i've seen it where just one parent going into a classroom and talking about this and sharing in a really safe environment with their child what's going on and why has revolutionized an entire year group because they've all gone oh you've now got all of the quiet ones participating and, and sharing opinions just through doing things like um, we usually think pair share, where it was have a time to think, share with a partner and then out loud, which then allows everybody to do all the parts of things that work for, work for them. Yeah. Sorry, lots of rambling. No, it makes a lot of sense. I and mean, we, to some extent, had this last parents evening. Uh, our daughter is, is one of those people. I think it's more social anxiety in her case, but I had a conversation with one of her teachers. In fact, a couple mentioned it, but one who was adamant. Like, if she doesn't put her hand up and ask questions, if she doesn't engage and ask those higher level thinking kind of things, she won't get the top grades, which was said to us with child sat there. And I was like, mm, that that sets off all sorts of red flags as a as a parent, as a teacher, as, as an introvert, because that's, that's not the way that she learns. It's not that she's not thinking about all of the higher level topics and stuff. It's that she would rather chop off her arm than put it in the air in a classroom. And, and I, there's not an easy fix to that one. So it's, I guess, having a, a conversation. Well, I think that, yeah, the, the conversation, you know, we, we've never asked, have we? What the, I mean, it's probably I'd, come back to sort of... I kind of have, but which is why I think it's more of a social anxiety thing yeah. with her. But but yeah, it's difficult. And and particularly if you're nowadays doing parents' evening online and you've literally got five minutes before you get cut off 
there's not a lot of time to have those conversations. It's part of why we exist as the, the parent guide to GCSE, because mm-hmm. you can't get across all the stuff that you need to as a parent and ask all the questions in that short space of time. And, and if you don't know, you can't help. So, yes, I I like the idea of facilitating those conversations, being clear on what the reason is that your child's not not able to do that. We then suggested, for example, at school, I think they've got a green page in their planner and a red page in their planner. If she puts the green page up, it means I've finished. I need something more challenging, please, or I need something extra. Because, again, she won't put her hand up. And we don't want her sat there not doing anything. She'll get bored. The teachers don't want her sat there not doing anything. But that's the only solution outside of her going, please help, and putting her hand up, which Mm. isn't going to happen. So I guess it's finding the space to have that conversation that's the challenge as a parent. It is. And I I, I love that method of differentiating her needs in order to communicate that, to get and work in everyone's favour with it. But the real life for time both for parents children and teachers in a very high pressure situation can be really hard to do yeah. and the other so the other two things which are worth mentioning possibly are um if somebody is really nervous about making that kind of contribution in the classroom how do we build a confidence through celebrating small wins of of doing that rather than well that was nice but it would have been better if you had done so and so which we tend to hear quite a lot so one of the ways that works for people is to have a rehearsed sentence starter. If they do want to contribute or they don't want to say a certain thing, have I practiced this, practice saying it out loud, saying it with two people, three people. I've had that quite a lot with people before. And it's only over a starting point because once they do build confidence up with that, they then adapt that. But that little bit of what do I say is then removed. But then we have the, the what if, what if I ask something and then people think a certain way that's the confidence building coming in as well. Mm. Yeah, gosh, there's a lot to uh, lot to think about. Just so I'm just thinking um, about another question I've got here. It comes back to the confidence thing you just mentioned. Um, somebody who basically is great at sport, it doesn't matter if it's a boy or a girl, it's a child, um, great at sport um, and expresses themselves in the sports team superbly, go into the classroom, n- yeah, not, not nothing, but certainly not confident enough to to volunteer uh, answers, put hands up, whatever. That's purely a confidence thing rather than, because if they're great at sport, you can you can show off your skills, but if you're not potentially that great academically, then I guess you're gonna sit there and think, I don't wanna say it just in case it's wrong, it's a confidence thing rather than an introvert thing. There's so many parts of that, which I love. Um, so whenever there's a discrepancy and someone is very different in one context from another, I love to explore with them why that is. In this situation, for example, is it that they are still quite nonverbal in that sporting thing, but they can express physically what's going on? That's one thing. If they are very communicative with their sports colleagues and then suddenly aren't in the classroom, that's a different case as well. And that probably would go back to confidence in when I'm a sport, I know what I'm doing. I have that confidence and that understanding of the topic. But in this academic topic, I'm not quite sure what's going on. And then the contrast to that person of the supreme confidence they might have in something they specialise in really, really compares to um, the other part of it, more than somebody who is possibly quite across the board. But again, it would be, um, I, I've had people in most situations and the answer has been different for each one. So again, it's thinking about, well, are we assuming it's confidence or is it possible there are other elements um of this as well and i would probably throw out uh, as a parent one of the most useful things i mean i i did it as part of my teaching um we went to a conference and we actually heard carol dweck speak about mindsets growth mindset versus fixed mindset but it's something we've very much taken on board as parents it's it's the way that children view their intelligence and you know, a, a growth mindset says I can learn new things. And we know that when you learn new things, you make new connections in your brain, it gets stronger, it gets better, it gets faster. If you're a fixed mindset, it's very much, I'm right or wrong, this is how smart I am, and and that's that. And so that you tend to get the people who then will avoid looking stupid in any way, shape or form, because they won't step out of their comfort zone. So um, Carol Dweck's book, Mindset, um, is very, very good and, and well worth a look for all parents. I'm just 
it just seemed like an appropriate moment to throw that one in there because it, it fits quite nicely with all of this and the confidence building and the way that you talk to your child about all these things. So, Can I add another one that, that mm. really goes well with that? I'm a huge fan. My first head teacher introduced us to Carol Dweck early on. I get the audio book and go, oh, this is amazing. And I will do that a lot, a lot of my, from children, parents, corporate clients, the growth mindset part. The bit that sits really nicely alongside it is self-compassion research. Um, so looking at people like Christian Neff, who is kind of the most famous one in there, but the way that we treat ourselves when things do go wrong, even on top of the growth mindset, are we kind to ourselves as we are to someone else when they have something going wrong? Or do we re-beat ourselves up and that inner critic takes a massive thing? A lot of my quiet introvert clients have got very low scores on self-compassion. So it's worth, there's loads of free stuff out there on that. So it's worth having an explore. Yeah, and, and I'll add as well, it really does make a difference when you start actively working on that. I was always quite self-critical um, and particularly in the last six months or so since figuring out that I have ADHD and that is why my brain works the way it does, I've stopped beating myself up over all the little things that I always thought were personality quirks or laziness or whatever that I now know are just, my brain works differently, it's wired differently, I can't do much about that. I work with my brain as it is rather than trying to fight it. And that has made a massive, massive difference to how I feel about all sorts and, and how I talk to myself. So you can you can have quite a big impact on that. Um, and it's possibly one of the most valuable things I think I've ever done. So yeah. oh, I love that. One. Yeah. Um, right. Well, I mean, we could we could do this for hours, Absolutely. but I think we've probably reached a sensible point to to stop on that one. So a massive, massive thank you for, for A, giving up your time, but for B pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone <laughs> and uh, and saying yes to podcasts because I think Actually, that's, that's going to really help a lot of parents listening so it's uh, it's been well worth it thank you thank you very much pleasure thank you so much both of you invited to be on here really appreciate it thanks for listening to the parent guide to education podcast please favorite or follow us on your preferred podcast app to ensure you get notified as each episode is released we'd also be grateful if you could leave us a great review or rating See you on the next episode.